get started, Anderson? I think so. So I was waiting for about like two more minutes and then, yeah. Looks like people Sounds are good. showing up, yeah. I managed to get on the binder with no issues, so I'm hoping everyone else is on the So actually, I realized that it's it's taking a while, at least like a few, uh, few, a few seconds. So I'll probably have people um, launch the binders as we do the introductions. Um, that way, uh, it doesn't um, uh, take time from us. Sounds good. All right. One more minute and then we'll get started. Okay, let's do this. Um, good morning, everyone. Oh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on uh, which side of the planet you're joining us from. Um, so my name is Anderson Vanihirgui. I work as a software engineer at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Uh, so I'll be co-hosting this tutorial with uh, Deepak and, uh, and Martin Durant. So I'll let them sell, uh, I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, Deepak and Martin, do you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Deepak Cherian. I am a oceanographer at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, which is where Anderson is too. And I'm also a member of the X-ray core team. Hello, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm Martin. Um, I work for Anaconda and I'm in Toronto right now. And I'm actually a bit of an outsider for X-ray, so I'll be learning something in this tutorial too. Thank you, Deepak and Martin. Okay, good. Um, one more second, actually. So, let me actually share my screen. Okay, share. Okay. Um, so, um, what time is it? Okay, we'll probably get started in one one minute. Um, hopefully, uh, by then most people will have showed up. Um, but um, in the meantime, so please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat section. Um, uh, please let us know where you're tuning in from um, and maybe um, how and what you use X-ray for. Um, and if you have questions for us, post them in the chat section um, as well. Um, in the meantime, um, let's see, you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so please uh, go to this repo. Um, so this is github.com slash X-ray contrib slash X-ray tutorial. Um, so what you want to do, you want to actually launch Binder. Um, it may take a few uh, few seconds, so it's better that uh, you go ahead and do it now. Um, so you just click on that uh, badge, which basically has a link in it that will take you to to this page. Um, should probably take maybe 60 seconds, uh, uh, depending on how busy the system is. But yeah, so go ahead um, and launch Binder. I just want to say I appreciate people joining from all over the world where I, I can't even imagine what time of day it is in uh, Cape Town and Tasmania, I think I saw. You're particularly welcome. Hold on, yeah. 
yeah, we have people all over. Yeah, this is nice. Wait, I, I thought this was the pub. I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> I got some tea here, so. Okay, people from UK. Um, well, actually, Thomas, what time is it now for you? Uh, it's like 1 a.m., Anderson. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. Like I said, I just, That's I, thought this was, I thought we all were going to the pub together. So, um, you know, but I'm here. I'm happy. This is great. Uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah. No, it's good to see you. Thank you for, thank you for organizing this. It's great to see you guys. Yeah, hopefully... Um, uh, future sessions, we'll, we'll try to uh, accommodate uh, people from uh, other time zones as well. So uh, here in Colorado, it's, it's nine. Uh, so it's a good time for me, but yeah, 1 a.m. Okay, that's a, that's a different, uh, yeah. So I hope, I don't know why, I don't know why Binder is taking a while, even though it's not really building the image. Um, but in the meantime, let me actually talk about something. Um, so, so basically, so the goal of uh, these uh, online tutorial series is basically to um, kind of give people like. A, an overview of what XRA is. Uh, but XRA itself is huge uh, in the sense that we cannot really uh, cover everything in 90 minutes. Um, and because of that, uh, it makes sense to basically um, split these sessions into um, shorter versions. Um, um, so today we're just going to focus on just the fundamentals, which is basically part one. Um, and then, we'll have some repeats, uh, like basically if people cannot attend uh, this session, they can attend another one um, in the future. Um, and then at some point, we'll also have, uh, it's not really advanced, but I'll say probably like intermediate advanced level stuff, um, which um, we cover DASC uh, and, and, and X-Array. Um, so it's probably that, some folks here are probably already uh, past the beginner um, uh, side of X-Array and they're interested in X-Array and Dask. Um, so unfortunately we won't cover that today because yeah, we don't have uh, enough time, uh, but it's coming soon. So we'll cover uh, X-Array and Dask in another session uh, in the coming weeks. So the way that uh, we're going to do things. So we're going to cover the, the fundamentals and uh, indexing for the first part of the tutorial. And then we're gonna have uh, like a five minute break and then we'll come back uh, and then do some computation and visualization. Um, and then after that, we'll basically adjourn. Um, uh, and then at some point in the next few weeks, we'll cover the uh, XRA and Dask stuff um, as well. Um, so let's see if Binder, okay, Binder should have started. Um, so is everyone uh, set up? Like basically do people, do, do people actually have access to Binder? Okay, good. Uh, so if you're having issues, uh, please let us know in the chat as well. Yeah, I think we can we can go ahead. Okay, and I'll keep an eye on the chat. Good, sounds good. Okay, so if you're in Binder, so go to this directory and then go to the online tutorial directory. Let me actually increase my. Okay. So you just wanna to go to this notebook. Um, I need to keep a few things here. Okay. okay, good, okay. All right. Okay, so in, in, in this first notebook, um, so we're basically going to uh, basically uh, 
provide a, like an overview of X-ray, um, especially for folks who are not familiar with it or who don't have experience with it. Um, and then we're going to um, describe uh, some of the core data structures in X-ray uh, and the components that uh, make them up. And then we're going to see how to um, open files, um, uh, basically navigate the X-ray data structures. Um, so first, what is X-ray? So if you're familiar with NumPy, um, I'm assuming that most people here are familiar with NumPy. So NumPy is basically the core of uh, scientific computing in, in Python, which provides um, a multi-dimensional array implementation. Um, and one of the things that, so NumPy is great, uh, but one of the things that NumPy lacks is that it doesn't have this concept of labels. Like basically, if you create an array in NumPy, you, you have to know what each axis uh, mean. Like basically what, um, what does each axis, uh, axis uh, refers to. Um, and this in itself, it's not a big deal if you're working, let's say like 1D or 2D arrays. But then once you start using multidimensional arrays, then you want to at least have an easier way of uh, not having to think all the time about where your axes or what do they represent. So this is where X-ray comes in, in the sense that X-ray basically adds or is uh, trying to basically add um, a labeled component to, to array implementations, including NumPy. So that basically your array has meaningful representation and uh, metadata associated with the, uh, with the data as well. So X-Array itself uh, is based largely on NCDF data model. Um, so I'll cover what NCDF is uh, down here, but um, the idea is that um, NCDF um, has this uh, data model and um, the data model is mostly for how the data is actually stored on disk but then X-ray implements that data model uh, for computation purposes. Um, X-ray is also, I would say heavily motivated by weather and climate uh, use cases, but you should know that it's domain agnostic, like in the sense that um, the whole concept of multidimensional uh, array computation is domain agnostic in the sense that you don't have um, like if you have some other use cases that are not weather and climate, you should still be able to use X-Array as well, as we will see. So there are two core data structures in X-Array. Uh, so there's a data array and then there's a data set. Um, and one way to think about um, a data set is that in a data set, you basically have multiple variables um, and those variables could share the same coordinate system. Um, so, so in a data set, you basically have variables and then you have coordinates as well and dimensions um, and attributes. And then each variable, uh, which in this case uh, is a data array, also could have its own uh, coordinate system uh, that maybe doesn't share with everything in the data set. Uh, it could also have its own dimensions, its own attributes, um, um, so yeah, so that's basically one way to think about it. So you have a data set and in a data set, you have a data array um, and they share a few things like dimensions, uh, coordinates, but a data array can have its own uh, specific uh, coordinates um, that may not be shared across all the variables in the data set. So now let's now basically look at what this actually means or what um, this looks like in action. So I I, I did mention earlier that um, XRA is trying to basically implement the NCDF data model. Um, and um, if you're not familiar with NCDF, um, it stands for Network Common Data Form. Um, it's basically a file format for storing multidimensional array data. And NCDF is, uh, a self-describing data format. And what that means is that 
when you say when you save data in SCDF, you you don't just save the data. You also save um, the metadata and the attributes that describes uh, the data. So once you look at the data, or once you look at an SCDF file, you have all that information. Um, and this in itself is is, is something that um, kind of makes it uh, really useful. Because if you start thinking about other file formats, like for instance, like, like a CSV, for instance, in a CSV, you could just have like a bunch of columns, but you don't really know what attributes go with each column. And you cannot easily attach uh, those attributes uh, to the data. So you have to find ways to, at some point, bridge the gap between the data and the metadata. Um, and that's that information or how you bridge the gap is basically up to you. But when it comes to uh, an SCDF, it tries to, to do the work for you in the sense that you give it the information and it will know how to keep track of those things. Um, so the SCDF itself is extensively used in geoscience communities, but it's also used in other fields um, as well. Um, so let's look at one of uh, these files. So the first thing that we do, we import X-Array. Um, so if you've used X-Array before, um, this is how most people tend to uh, import X-Array, but there's nothing that says that you should use the XR uh, alias. So if you want to use something different, that's also up to you. Um, so in this cell, I basically have a file. And this is a binary file. If you actually try to look at this file. Uh, it's basically, it's just a binary file. You won't actually be able to uh, look at it without having um, the necessary libraries. Uh, but what I'm doing, I'm basically telling X-Array to open this file and I specify engine here to be in SCDF four. And the reason why I specify the engine is that um, you could um, uh, pass uh, other engines here. So in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm specifying that I want X-Array to use SCDF four. And now if you look at the data set, so we basically have, um, so we have, as you can see, we have uh, three, uh, four sections. So we have the dimensions. So in this case, it's telling us the length of each dimension. So latitude 89, longitude 180, time 128. And then if you look at the coordinates, now we have uh, basically like more information about the coordinate system itself. So latitude, longitude, and time. As you can see, we don't just get the size, but we also get the values for those coordinates. So what I would invite you to do is basically click on uh, this icon here, which will basically kind of show you the actual values um, of the latitudes, for instance. Um, and then if you click on this um, like file icon, it should, should basically show you the attributes if they're there. Like in this case, um, as you can see, it would tell us what the units are. Um, so what is the long name for this uh, coordinate? Uh, in this case, it's also telling us the range of values. Um, it may also tell you what is the standard name. Um, so yeah, so basically these are the attributes and this, basically you can put whatever you want in there. Um, it's just that in this case, uh, this is how this uh, data set was uh, produced. So you can look at other uh, coordinates as well. So this is longitude. And then if you look at time, for instance, it will tell us um, like a couple of things um, as well. Um, and something else you notice about the time is that the time here is decoded in the sense that we don't have time values as uh, as floats. Like it's actually giving us uh, a daytime object. And the reason why this is happening is because by default, uh, the open data set function in X-Array will basically decode uh, time. Uh, and that is actually controlled by this argument, um, decode underscore times. So like in some cases you may 
one extra ray to not decode time. So all you have to do is basically just specify decode times equals to false. And what that gives you is basically time, but uh, as uh, uh, numeric values instead. Um, but in this case, we actually want X-ray to, to basically use the calendar information um, to turn these numeric values into time objects. So I just put this back. So yeah, so that's what a data set looks like. Um, and then now you'll see that it, uh, in the data variable section, we have one variable, in this case, SST, which um, is basically a 3D variable. Um, it depends what the, the coordinates are basically time, lat, and long. Um, again, we can look at the attributes. So in this case, it will tell us the long name, uh, like the units that we used, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and then we can also look at the values. And like in this case, we have too many values. So it won't, uh, it will just tell us how many values we have in there instead of uh, filling our screen with a bunch of values. Alison? Yes. Uh, there are two questions that may be good to address at this point. One was, yep. could you clarify the difference between dimensions and coordinates? Okay, so actually I had, um, I had this section here. Oh, that. great. Then we can yeah. just get to that then. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was the second one? The second one was, it was basically, um, if you have multiple data variables, um, can they have different time axes, for example, or time coordinates? Uh, so I think the only way that could happen is if basically the, the, the names are not the same. So if they're using the same the dimension names, then they need to to be exactly the same. At least, yeah, yeah, they need to be exactly the same. So, like in this case, if I had some other variable that maybe uses a different time reference, uh, maybe it doesn't have uh, time as one twenty eight values. I cannot also basically th that dimension cannot be time as well. So, I would have to call that uh, dimension something different, or that coordinate something different. And with that, then I should be able to uh, have the two variables in the same data set, but their coordinate system is somehow different in the sense that they're using different time references, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. So time underscore ref one uh, and yeah. So yeah, any other question? Okay, good. Okay. So again, um, so so this is this is an this is an HTML representation, or this is what a dataset looks like to X-ray. But then you can actually look at the actual NCDF representation by calling this M4 method, um, and basically this is how NCDF uh, would or is actually storing the data. Um, so as you can see, it's almost. I would say similar to what we have here in the sense that we have like the dimensions. Um, and as you can see, um, so in the variable section, we basically have also the coordinates there, but there's some information about what variables are actually coordinates. So when X-Array opens the file, it knows what to use as coordinates. Um, and then you also have the global attributes here. Um, so yeah, so again, so in a data set, you basically have uh, a mapping uh, or a key value uh, object where, um, so the keys in this case corresponds to data arrays or actual variables with their aligned uh, dimensions. Um, and then um, like in this case, you can look at the data vars, which will basically tell you the data variables that are in your, in your data set. Um, we can, um, so we know that we have SST here, and then this is one way you can actually um, select one variable. So if you do ds dot and then the name of the, the variable, um, but there's some caveats to this notation in the sense that the SST here needs to be um, 
Python, uh, it needs to be a valid Python identifier. And what that means is that if you have some like weird characters that, that wouldn't work. And also if you have spaces in the name that also wouldn't work. Um, so one way, uh, so as you can see, so I do DS and then SST and then the zero here, I'm basically indexing the first, um, on, so in the first axis, I'm taking the first index in there. Um, so another way of doing this, if um, I want to try this differently, is basically to use this um, square bracket notation and then pass in the name of the variable as a string. And this should allow you to basically access any variable, like even, even if you basically had something that had like spaces in it, that should work. So again, in this case, I'm basically picking the SSD variable and then just looking at the first uh, entry along the first axis, which is time. I guess a good thing to point out here is if uh, your variable name clashes with a method name, so like mean, uh, then this dictionary syntax is the only way that you could do it. So it's it's useful to know. Yeah. So usually if you don't want to run into those caveats, uh, at least in my case, I tend to use this notation since I don't have to worry too much about uh, those caveats. Uh, but if you use the, the dot notation, so the data set but SST, then you need to uh, be aware of those uh, issues. Like for instance, if you have like a variable that is called mean, mean is actually, um, um, it's a key, or it's, 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 a, it's a method uh, on uh, an XRA uh, object. So that would actually collide with the mean. Um, okay, so again, in this case, doing exactly what I just did right above, and then I'm just plotting which as you can see, um, I didn't really have to tell X-Ray anything about the plot, the, the type of plot that I wanted. So this um, uh, method uh, is, um, so X-Ray implements this method and then X-Ray knows how to basically, what type of uh, defaults to use. So in this case, I happen to have like a 2D array and then uh, X-Ray uh, realized that I also had the lat and lon uh, coordinates and then from there it will basically produce a map by default. Uh, but if this was like a 3D or anything beyond 2D, it will basically give me like a histogram. Or if this was like a 1D, it would actually give me uh, a line. Um, so again, um, that was just like a quick way of showing you uh, what we're looking at. We'll come back to the plotting later. Um, and then there's a bunch of stuff that you can pass in here. Like if you want to change the color map, for instance, um, or if you want to change the, the figure size. Um, for more information, you basically have to look at the documentation uh, of XRA, uh, but we'll, we'll have time to look at this. So, so now, so these are my dimensions. Again, this is just telling me the names of the dimensions and their length. Uh, and then, um, these are my coordinates. And then you see this um, asterisk in front of uh, different uh, coordinates. Um, and we'll see what that means. Um, down. Okay, so now if you look at the attributes, if you basically print the uh, attribute uh, of the data set, this is basically uh, a dictionary of the global attributes. And there's a bunch of stuff here and Usually this is up to whoever is producing the data. So you can basically put in a bunch of stuff in here. Like, like in this case, it's describing like what project uh, this data set was, was produced as part of and a bunch of other stuff that maybe are not necessarily needed for computation purposes, but they're necessary for bookkeeping. Like for instance, like knowing, for instance, like when was, the, when was this data set produced or who produced the data set or who to contact and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, like in this case, it's telling us like when the data set was modified, for instance. Um, and yeah. So now if we look at the data array, which 
um, we kind of touched uh, upon uh, a few minutes ago. Um, it has almost the same, um, I'd say, um, same features as a data set, but then it has some special things to it. Like in this case, um, so one of the special thing is actually uh, this data uh, property, which actually points you to the actual array. Um, so X-Array is flexible enough that it doesn't really force you to only have NumPy arrays. So you can basically have some other compatible uh, array implementations um, backing your actual variables or data arrays. So in this case, we actually happen to have like a NumPy array. So this is basically if you wanted to just extract the NumPy array, this is how you would do it. So data set, then specify the name and then dot data. And that should give you the NumPy array. Um, again, if now we look at the dimensions, um, so let me just print this again. So if you look at the dimensions, basically the dimensions are just named axes, um, which is basically what I'm trying to cover here. So basically the difference between coordinates and dimensions. Um, so one way to think about dimensions is just, they're just names of the axes. So now in NumPy, you don't have that concept in the sense that if you have a 3D array, it's up to you to know what the first axis in the array uh, points to, like, is it time, is it lat, is it long? That's up to you to know. Um, but then X-Array allows you to give names to those uh, dimensions or those axes. That way, I don't really care where time is. Like, is it is it the first, is it the second, is it the third axis? I don't care. I just, I, I just tell X-Array uh, what uh, dimension I'm interested in or what, yeah, so the name of the dimension and XR will figure out what uh, axis uh, we're talking about. And then the coordinates uh, um, are basically the name dimensions and also the corresponding values. Like in this case, uh, instead of just having time, we can actually have um, uh, data ticks that basically tells us like, instead of just saying, this is the first index, we can actually say, this is actually this date, or this is actually this uh, actual latitude or longitude value. So, so basically coordinates are just your axes basically with their names, but also the corresponding ticks um, along those axes. Okay. Do we have any questions? Um, nothing that I think needs to be addressed at this point. Okay, good. Okay, so this is exactly the same thing we saw um, two minutes ago, but then this is how you basically uh, extract uh, like a coordinate variable. Like basically you have a data set and specify the, the variable and then, and then just the name uh, of, the, of the coordinate variable. So in this case, this will actually give me the actual uh, longitude values. Um, um, another way of doing this is basically using the dictionary notation where you do this. Again, this will basically give you exactly the same thing, uh, but it will allow you to deal with like, weird names and stuff like that. So it, it's up to you to choose what notation you want to use. And then another way of actually extra ex extracting like a current variable is basically doing ds.coords and then passing in uh, uh, the name of the, the coordinate that you're interested in um, or the dimension name. Um, that should give you uh, the actual values of your uh, coordinate. Like in this case, as, as I was saying, it's not just telling us that this axis is uh, is of length 128. It's also giving us uh, ticks along that axis as well. So yeah. Um, and then um, let's now talk about attributes. So, so, so when it comes to global attributes, um, I would say that it's basically up to you to decide what goes into the global attributes because 
X-Array doesn't necessarily use these attributes to do any computation. Uh, so like in this case, again, this is just a dictionary and this is, um, so as you can see, these are the global attributes of the entire data set, but each variable uh, or each data array could also have its own attributes. Uh, so like in this case, these are the attributes that are actually specific to, to the SST variable, um, as you can see they're different from the global attributes. Um, so in some cases, um, most people at least um, one thing to um, always keep in mind is if you have your data array, it's always nice to make sure that at least you propagate uh, some of these uh, attributes. Like for instance, if you want to make sure that you remember like what unit um, um, is actually uh, your data array uh, using. So this is how you would um, do that. So just in this dictionary, specify units and then um, give it an identifier. Um, and this becomes useful, um, or this will probably become very useful in the future, because uh, there's a there's a package called Pint X-Array, which will, will be able to interpret this information and carry this information over. Like for instance, if you take some variable that is, let's say like in meter, and then you add that to some other variable that is in, let's say kilometers, um, that package, Pint X-Array, uh, basically would know that it needs to do the conversion for you instead of you having to do a bunch of multiplication and a bunch of uh, automatic manipulations to keep track of what unit. So by having like, for instance, like the units um, um, in the attributes, uh, Pint X-Array, which is more like an extension to X-Array, you should be able to understand uh, some of these things. Um, you can set your own attributes as well. So the way to do this, again, the attributes is basically just a dictionary. So just define a key and then just put values in there. Like in this case, I'm just defining some uh, random attribute and then putting the value in it. And here's my attribute. And as you can see, that's just different from what I had uh, here. So yeah. Okay, so there's something that I didn't cover in this notebook, uh, but then I think we probably have time to, to go over is, so one of the popular question is, what if my data is actually not an SCDF, right? Like what if uh, you have some, I don't know, custom file format and you still want to use X-Array. Unfortunately, you won't be able to have like this built-in uh, function to read your data. So what, what X-Array would allow you to do is you can read your data um, externally, like basically using other packages um, and you can actually construct the data set by hand. Uh, it's some, uh, depending on the structure of your data, it may be more involved, uh, but it's not, it, it's, not, it's not really a painful um, uh, process. So basically the idea is, um, like for instance, let's say, let's say I read my data. Uh, let me actually give you like a, like a simple example. Um, uh, let me just put NumPy as NP for instance. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to create, let's say, In another cell. Okay, so random. Um, I don't know, let me just do this then reshape maybe 10 by 1000 by, by 100. Okay, so, so this is what my data looks like, right? Um, Again, it doesn't have all the metadata and stuff like that, but what I can do, I can actually create, let's say, let me call it um, array equals to 
So there's a bunch of ways of uh, instantiating or creating like a data array or data set. Uh, so it's up to you to choose what uh, syntax is, 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 is easier. Um, but one way, so like in this case, I'm going to create like an empty, uh, actually, no, actually in this case, I'm going to pass in the data. Um, and as you can see, um, by just passing in the data, so Excel will basically uh, assign some dummy uh, dimension names to my um, uh, to my data, uh, but then I can also specify some of this stuff myself. So I can say my dimensions are let's say maybe x and y, uh, for instance. So now now what you get is basically um, um, a data array, but then I, I control the names of the dimensions. Uh, but in this case, I don't have any coordinates. As you can see, nothing is defined uh, for my coordinates. Um, so what I can do, uh, I can do this, uh, where the coordinates here is basically a dictionary. So the dictionary, so I specified the name of the, the, of the dimension. And then I specify the actual uh, values of that uh, coordinate, like in this case, so X is, so 10, so I may just do like something like NP dot arrange, maybe let's just do 10 through 20, for instance. And then now I have this, uh, I have X, uh, I basically have X coordinate with these values. And I could do the same thing for, for the other dimension as well. In this case, I can just do np dot, let's say, uh, let's just do this for instance. So now my two dimensions, X and Y also have corresponding coordinates as well. So again, what I was trying to de demonstrate here is that if you're not able to use uh, built-in functions to read your data, you can just read your data. Um, um, using whatever package uh, uh, you need uh, for those particular file formats. And then you can then construct uh, data arrays and data sets by hand by basically passing in the data to X-Array and then specifying uh, this information as well. Any question? Uh yeah, let me just read this. They're somewhat long. Okay, let's see. Okay. So Juri is asking. <laughs> Go ahead, Deepa. I think these are a little too complicated. Um, I have to think about them. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. Okay, so should I move to the next notebook or do we still want to address some of these questions? Uh, I think so, maybe give a three minute break Okay. Um, before we move to the next one. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so one thing that I actually wanted to point out is if you actually want to know, um, so if you go back here, I did specify this engine argument here. Um, so if you actually want to know like what type of like engines are actually supported uh, by this function, you go to, to the documentation page of X-Array uh, and then go to, so API reference and then look for, let's see, where would that be? Okay, open data set, okay, open data set. So, so these are the supported engines. So it's like, um, it's like for instance, um, if you have like um, a link to like an opened up uh, data set, for instance, you can specify that. So XRA should be able to 
uh, for instance, like read some nested files from uh, uh, an opened up server, for instance. Uh, if you have HDF5, but HDF5 that that is uh, at least NCDF compliant, because when it comes to HDF5, you can basically define like you have you have almost freedom to do whatever you want in in HDF5, um, and that means that you can just pass any HDF5 uh, file to XRA. Um, so in this case, uh, if you have HDF5 files that are NCDF4 compliant, then you can pass this engine. Um, and then uh, there's Pineal, uh, and then there's CFGrib, um, um, and then there's sudo NCDF. I've never used sudo NCDF, but yeah, some of the NCDF files out there, they're just, yeah, they use some weird. I guess the high level point is that there's a bunch of built-in support for a bunch of file uh, formats. But if you have something, there was a question about a binary file. You know, the idea is that you read that in, in how you're used to doing it, um, just like, and then you would use it in these data array constructor functions, uh, just like the NumPy array that Anderson showed. Yeah, so in this the cell 32, you have data, which is a NumPy array in this case, but it could be anything that is array-like and it should work. Yeah, um, it could be a list or, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, are the three minutes over or do we still have? Yeah, um, there was one comment, uh, which was that it was maybe a little quick. So maybe you can just give a rough overview of the data set again, and then we can move to the next one. Okay, good. So, yeah. so let's go back here. So, so basically this is um, the summary. So you have a data set and in data set, you have basically a bunch of data arrays. Um, and a data set has um, dimensions, attributes and coordinates. So in this case, the coordinates in the data set, at least the coordinates that are described in the data set, they're basically um, like an aggregation of the coordinates that uh, you have in uh, all the data, data arrays, but each data array can have its own uh, subset of that um, as coordinates. Uh, and then we talked about attributes. Um, so, when it comes to global attributes, and when I say global attributes, are the attributes of the data set itself, those tend to just be there for bookkeeping purposes. Um, but then when it comes to attributes of data arrays, those are actually useful uh, for computational purposes, or they, some of them uh, may be uh, useful uh, in the coming months as, as, as XRA adds uh, support for like unit and stuff like that. Um, and something else that I should point out is, as you can see, when I did the plotting here, I didn't really provide that much information to this function, but you can see that XRA is able to basically, for instance, like define the title of the plot, uh, uh, give me the labels of the, the plot axes, um, some description of the color bar and stuff like that. All this information is actually coming from the attributes of the data array. Um, so like in this case, you can see that. So this is basically the long name. Uh, and these are basically the name, I think these are basically the, so latitude here is also the long name of the coordinate lat and degrees north, that's the units. So yeah, so as you can see, when it comes to the attributes of a data array, those are actually used internally by XRA to do uh, a couple of things. Um, and what was the other thing? So, and, and the last point was basically about what if my data format uh, is not uh, natively supported by XRA, how would I uh, get my data into XRA? So you just open the, the, the the files using whatever package um, is useful for those uh, file formats. And then uh, just make sure that you get your data into either like an umpire array or some 
uh, array-like uh, container. In this case, it could be like a list, for instance, uh, and then just pass that information to, to X-Array, and then X-Array should be able to construct um, um, a data array or a data set for you. So one thing that I didn't cover is actually how do you save um, um, like a data set or a data array to disk? Like for instance, what if I'm done and I actually want to save uh, this? Um, so there's a few ways of doing this. So there's um, two net CDF, uh, so, so two net CDF method. Net CDF, ah, not to type. Okay, net CDF, and basically this function, if you look at it, um, it will basically okay. This is not that useful, um, um, but basically what you just need to pass in here is basically the path of the the output file, um, and um, and also. You could also specify like the engine, for instance. I think, yeah, that's also something that you can uh, set. And XR will basically produce an SCD, an SCD file for you. Okay, I think we should move on to the next okay. notebook since, yeah. Okay. Okay. So we basically saw how to read the data uh, and like a bunch of components. Um, of, of an X array data set or an X array um, uh, data array. So the next thing that we're going to look at is basically how do you like index or how do you select um, subsets of your data? Um, and there's a couple of ways of doing this. Um, and this is what we're going to look into in this notebook. So again, what X array is providing is basically giving us a uh, uh, these labels that are added on top of our existing arrays. Um, and X-Array gives us like a bunch of ways of um, taking advantage of that. Um, so if you're used to NumPy, uh, so if I do this for instance, in this case, again, remember this is how you would extract a NumPy array from, um, from a data array. So a data set, provide the name of the, the variable and the dot data property. Um, like, and in this case, if I look at, so I have, this is the shape for instance, but the information is not really that useful in the sense that I'm like, okay, what is, like in this case, I could say, give me all the time steps and then give me the uh, 20th entry. Actually, this is, yeah, this would be, yeah. Give me the 20th entry and then the 40th entry along the second and the third axis. And those are the values that I get. But again, I'm like, okay, what does this actually mean? Like basically, how do I know that this is actually time? I, 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 that knowledge itself is not embedded uh, in NumPy. So it's up to you to know what each axis corresponds to. Um, but I just know that I did select all the time steps uh, and then I did select the 20th, uh, 20th entry um, along the second axis and the 40th entry along the third axis. Um, so X-Array makes that easier for us um, in the sense that if you want to use this NumPy indexing logic, um, it doesn't uh, prevent you from doing that. Um, so what you just need to do is instead of extracting the data uh, out of an X-Array object, you can just use the same notation on a data array. And what you get back is actually a data array as well. Um, but again, I didn't really specify, uh, like still it's not clear what this means, uh, but as you can see, what I get back is basically um, all the time steps. Uh, for these latitude, well, for basically in this case, 48 corresponds to the 20th uh, entry uh, along the latitude uh, coordinate and then 80 corresponds to the 40th entry. Um, but then instead of actually using this notation, I can actually uh, do positional indexing. And what that means is I can use the I cell uh, 
So the I sales basically I'm indexing by, okay, I'm selecting by index. So in this case, I'm saying, give me the 60th um, index. Yeah, and then along basically the latitude and the 40th uh, index along the uh, longitude. Um, and then I can do the plotting. Uh, so if you look at this, this is basically like a 1D uh, array. And then if I do the plotting, again, XRA is clever enough to know this, this is a 1D array. So it will just give me a, a line plot for that. So this is basically the time series. Um, and this is the time series for, this is actually the actual latitude and longitude values. Um, uh, so the nice thing is, if you actually know what values you're interested in, you can actually tell XRA to select those using basically those values instead of just giving it the indices. And that's what we do with cell. So there's I cell and then there's cell. So with I cell, you're basically indexing, you're basically selecting by index, but then with cell, you're actually selecting by label and by actual values. So in this case, I'm saying, give me the data that corresponds to basically latitude equals to minus 32 and longitude equals to 80. But then for this to work, you need to have lat and lon as coordinates. Because if you basically don't have the actual values for those uh, uh, axes, then this won't work. Um, uh, so there's a few things, I'll cover them down here. Uh, but again, I can also specify, because we decoded time, remember when we opened the data set, so the time was already uh, decoded as a time object. We can actually pass in um, actual, like, like, like a string. Like in this case, I'm saying, give me all the values that corresponds to latitude equals to 50, longitude equals to 200, and time equals to uh, 2020. And the, in this case, it will basically give me all the data that corresponds to this year. Um, so as you can see, it gave me, uh, all the months in this case, uh, January through August. Um, and then, uh, so here we're just giving it like a single value, uh, but you can actually give it slices. Um, and like in this case, I'm saying, give me all the data that corresponds to time between um, May of 2019 uh, and uh, July of 2020 exclusive, like basically this last value is actually not included. Um, and, oh, it's actually included. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, so this is a good place to jump in. Um, we um, inherit these rules from pandas and slices in pandas are kind of inclusive on both sides uh, in label space. Um, Good. I don't know. I, I, for some reason, I always assume that actually it doesn't include the last value. Okay, so that's good to know. Um, so yeah, again, as you can see, I didn't like. I only had to specify the year and the month, and then X-ray is clever enough to basically figure out like, okay, what uh, what time values uh, fall into this uh, range uh, of values. So as you can see, I have yeah, so fifteen months. Yeah. Um, so in some cases, uh, like in this case where we're dealing with like, like, like floating point numbers. Um, um, so as you, as you know, like you cannot really like, like equality like when it comes to floating points, you can't just do like, cause at least the way that floating point are represented from the computer's perspective, you cannot do X equals to 3.4 cause to the computer's perspective, it's not actually 3.4, it's probably like 3.4000000 something. So uh, what XRA allows you to do is basically you can actually select the, you can specify how you want this selection to be done. Like in this case, I'm saying, select the nearest value to this. Um, and I do that by basically specifying this method here, argument saying nearest. And then XRA will basically look do like a lookup and say, okay, what value is closest to what you gave me here? 
And in this case, the closest value was actually 252 for longitude and 52 for, for latitude. Um, and then there's a, you can pass in other stuff, like for instance, um, you can do pad, you can do, uh, uh, you can basically propagate, um, like you can do like a backfill and, and, and like a bunch of other stuff, depending on what you're interested in. So, so far we've been busy, we've been doing this on data arrays, um, but we can do pretty much the same thing on a data set. Uh, so as you can see, I'm using DS instead of DA. And what I get back is basically like a data set. Uh, and what that means is that uh, this logic is applied to all the variables in the data set. Um, so if I had a, uh, more than one variable, they'll also be uh, um, indexed or uh, XI would actually return values that corresponds to uh, to the respective data arrays. Um, so yeah. And then lastly, um, this is probably advanced, uh, but so what I'm doing here in this example is I'm basically doing vectorized indexing. And what that means is like in this case, I define um, um, I can trans, uh, trans sect of, of points that I'm interested in. Um, and I basically pass those values to, to X-Array and X-Array will basically give me back um, um, a subset of my uh, original uh, data array or data set um, using this uh, trans sect of points that I provided. Um, so like if you actually wanted to index, um, like basically the takeaway is that if you actually wanted to do a complex indexing, there, there are ways of doing it. And then lastly, um, there's a where, so if you're familiar with NumPy, so NumPy has a, like a where method that basically allows you to index according to a condition and also define what to do for values that meet that condition and values that don't meet that condition. And in this case, what I'm doing, I'm basically selecting my SST variable and then I call the dot where, and this is my condition. Like basically I'm saying, select values uh, that are not null, uh, basically not missing. And I'm saying for the values that don't uh, meet this condition, just replace them with this uh, placeholder. Um, so what I get is basically, instead of having uh, missing values, I basically replace uh, missing values with this placeholder. Uh, I could change the condition here. I could say maybe select all the values that are less than this, that are less than um, this particular value, for instance, if you, if you had like a threshold of values that you're interested in, you could pass that as a condition and if you don't specify the condition here, or if you don't specify the values, the, the actual value or the actual placeholder for values don't, don't, that don't miss that, that don't, don't meet that condition, Excel will basically uh, fill in uh, missing values. So like basically this is what that would look like if I didn't specify um, the actual value to use for values that don't meet this condition. Okay, so it looks like we have a few questions. So, uh, so, so Mike, mm -hmm, go ahead. One question is you had negative 99 as um, a scalar value. And so the question was, can it be an array instead? Uh, actually, I don't have a good answer to that. Do you, do you know, like you know better than I? Uh, I don't remember for the data array method, but there is a xr.var uh, where you can do that. Uh, okay, but then how, okay, maybe this is getting into the weeds, but. It definitely should, if it's it copied should. from the, the pandas way of doing that. I bet it works. Oh, okay. I bet, yeah, I would bet on it working too. I just don't use it. Okay, yeah. I've never seen, I've never seen uh, someone using it that way. 
Um, so yeah, it's probably worth uh, trying. Do we have any other questions? Sorry, I just looked at the documentation and that it can be a scalar, a data array, or even a data set. So it's pretty fancy. Oh, okay. But then if you, if, if, if you, if you try to do it that way, you, there's a few things you have to keep track of. Like you need to make sure that things are consistent, right? Like for instance, yeah. if you're using uh, awesome. like a data set, you want to make sure that the dimension names are exactly the same. Uh, yeah. Okay. Do we have any other question? Sophie's question there sounds like something that should be raised on, on the repo. If there's a specific way to do that. Oh, yeah, so, yeah so it's a question about argument. I think we should address that somewhere else. It's kind of, yeah. Okay, good. Oh. So this is a bug, I guess, in X-Array. Okay. Maybe. Um, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. This so, is great. Did I miss anything about uh, indexing? Uh, as far as I can tell, I think, yeah, we we did look at uh, pretty much what uh, this mo this notebook uh, promised. Um, anything else that people? No, I think you see? did a good job. So there are not much questions. Um, but this is to me like a big advantage of XRA is where you use the metadata like coordinate labels to and dimension names to make your life easier. So. Yeah. So I guess we can move on to the next one. We have, I think, 20 more minutes. Okay. Okay. So let's move on to the next notebook. Okay. So in this notebook, which is actually the last for today. Um, so we're going to look at <clears throat> how to do um, like a couple of uh, things like, like actually doing computation um, uh, and doing like things like aggregation or reductions. Um, <clears throat> so again, we read our data. Um, in this case, um, um, selecting my variable, um, and I can do things like this. Like I, I can take that uh, array and then just add a scalar to it. And XArray and NumPy, they're clever enough to know what to do. So you basically do an element-wise operation. Um, so in, in this case, basically you can do whatever you want in terms of like element-wise operation. I can divide, I can, multi I can do multiplication, like basically the, the basic automatic operations should be able to work uh, without really having to specify any um, additional information. Just give it a scalar and it'll know what to do. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's usually the simplest thing to do. Um, and something else that you'll see is that things are basically carried over, like things like dimensions and coordinates and stuff like that. Um, um, like in this case, I think what I was trying to do in this operation, I was basically trying to do like some unit conversion. So my my data is actually in degrees Celsius, uh, and I'm just converting it to Kelvin. Um, um, and again, like I mentioned, um, uh, there's some ongoing work to actually uh, make the unit conversion uh, an easy thing to do, or at least make. XRA clever enough to know what to do. Like in this case, I did, I did a conversion, but then if I look at the attributes, okay, actually in this case, you will see that the attributes basically just disappeared. Um, and that's mostly, I would say, so Deepak, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I would say that that's, that's a way for XRA to basically keep it safe. Like, instead of just assuming that it knows what happened uh, in the operation, it'll just throw the attributes unless you tell it to preserve them. Um, so in this case, it doesn't preserve them by default, uh, but there's a way of basically telling XRA to keep track of uh, the attributes. Um, and you can see why XRA would want to do this, at least I assume uh, this is one of the reasons. Like in this case, I did a unit conversion 
But then if it keeps the attributes, uh, this is not going to change. You'll still say that it's actually still degree Celsius, even though I did uh, unit conversion. Um, so with a pint X-ray, um, um, the idea is that since it has these uh, attributes with all this necessary information, if I do something like this, it should be able to know, OK, now we're moving from degree Celsius to uh, to Kelvin. Uh, but you may have to provide some additional information to it. Uh, but if you actually wanted to keep track of the attributes, there's a global option uh, in X-Array where if you do X-Array.set option, there's a, there's a keep attributes. Yeah, there's a keep attributes uh, option which by default is actually false, uh, but then we can just do equals to true. And that will basically enable X-Array to uh, propagate the attributes. Uh, so in this case, if I do this thing again, now I can see that I, I have my original attributes as well. But like I said, to be safe, I would actually want to uh, update the attributes here to at least mention what I just did here, which I just did a unit conversion. So instead of just saying that units are still degree Celsius, I can just say that it's now Kelvin. Okay. So so yeah, so that's 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 enough uh, about uh, basic arithmetic operations. So the next type of uh, uh, operations we can look at is actually what what is usually called aggregation or reductions, like where you have an array and then you want to apply some um, uh, function along like a particular or a list of uh, axes. And what you get back is basically like a reduced uh, uh, data set or a reduced data array. So in this case, there's a bunch of stuff that you can do. Like, so there's a mean, like, like most of like the popular like mean, median, standard deviation, um, there's a bunch of them, um, uh, but in this case, I'm just going to compute basically the mean along the time dimension. The way you would have done this in NumPy, you'll have to know what basically, what is this axis? Is it the first, is it the second? And uh, in NumPy, you'd have done something that looks like, for instance, like mean and then axis, for instance, equals two to zero. But if you if you think about it, if you if you come to, if you come back to this code, let's say, I don't know, a week later, you may not you may not know exactly what actually happened here. Like, was it was this time? Was it was this latitude? But doing it this way, as you can see, it's it's really clean in the sense that anybody that you give this code to, they would know. Okay, this is actually doing a mean across the the, the time dimension. Um, and then what you get is basically. Uh, average across the time dimension. As you can see, we're only left with latitude and longitude. Um, you can also do operations across uh, like a list of dimensions. Like in this case, I'm computing like standard deviation across latitude and longitude, uh, which if you look at it, this should give me like a 1D array. Um, across time, and then I can just basically plot this time series. And that is basically the standard deviation uh, over time. Um, so yeah, so that's a nice thing. Like you don't have to think or you don't have to keep track of like what axes do you wanna apply certain operations on. You just need to know their names. That's all you need to know. Uh, so yeah, so again, there's a bunch of stuff uh, that this applies to in terms of aggregations. Um, so check the documentation or, yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay. So now let, look, let's look at some, I would say advanced, uh, but it's not really advanced in the sense that NumPy does it. And usually as a user, you don't really have to think too much about it. Um, and that is broadcasting. So think of, um, let's say you have, uh, 
so, so if you're not familiar with broadcasting, um, it's the idea that you can basically do operations on arrays that don't necessarily have the same shape. Like for instance, you could take an array that is, let's say 36 by two and add it to an array that is, let's say, I don't know, two by 36, for instance. And NumPy, for simpler case, things should work. Um, but then in some cases, you may have to, to do the work yourself. Um, uh, but in X-Array, all you need is to have uh, the coordinates or the dimensions well-defined. And X-Array will basically do the automatic broadcasting for you. So like in this case, in this one example, you have, let's say a data array uh, that is basically um, um, indexed across time. Um, and then you're adding that to some other array that is uh, indexed across space. And what do you get back at the end is basically something that is uh, time by space. Uh, but if you look at the shapes of these two arrays, uh, they're not the same, but they're compatible. And that's what basically broadcasting requires. Like for instance, you like, well, I won't go too much into the details, but um, um, if you're not familiar with uh, broadcasting in NumPy, uh, there's a good explanation on NumPy's uh, 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 documentation page about what broadcasting is actually doing. Uh, so X-Array takes that notion uh, further by basically applying these two named dimensions. Um, so a good example here is if you look at our data array. So we have a data array that is uh, basically 128 by 89 by 180. And for instance, let's say I actually want to subtract the mean across, um, across time from the original array. Um, and as you can see, my original uh, data array shape is basically 128 by 89 by 180. And my mean shape is 89 by 180. So if I do the subtraction of these two things, what I get back is basically something uh, that is 128 by 89 by 180. And X-Array is basically clever enough to know um, what to do. Um, and the way it does that is basically through broadcasting and also this concept of named dimensions. So we'll know, okay, you have lat and lon um, as a common thing between these two arrays, and then we'll know what to do. Uh, we basically would extend the the, the smallest uh, array to basically have a view that has the same shape as the the bigger array, and then we'll do element wise operation on that. Um, did I confuse anyone? Sorry to put you on the spot, but yeah. um, so it came up uh, like basically, could you illustrate the NumPy way of doing that computation? And then I think that okay. would clearly show why okay. X-Ray is nice. Okay, hopefully I know how to do it. Okay, so <laughs> if you look at, so, so this is DA. Let's actually extract the data. Uh, NP. Um, so DA and P, the shape. Um, and then let's do the same thing for the mean. So let's just extract DA mean the data. And then, so if I do, for instance, if I do what I just did here, so take the original array minus, so da dot np minus da. This should work. Um, and the reason why this works is that, again, broadcasting itself only requires that things are just consistent. Like basically they're like two rules, like the shapes, they don't need to be the same, but they need to be compatible. And what I mean by compatible is, in this case, I have um, a 3D array that I'm subtracting from, uh, like a 2D array that I'm subtra subtracting from a 3D. So what NumPy is going to do is basically going to extend uh, this uh, smaller array 
basically add like a new dimension to it. Um, and then we'll just do like an element wise operation. So doing something like this here doesn't really require us to do any work in the sense that the shapes were basically well set up. So we get exactly the same thing as what we um, had with yeah, X-ray. Um, sorry about that. Maybe, yeah. maybe if you added a transpose to DA mean NP, that would move it out of order. Yeah, so. Maybe that's a better example. Yeah, transpose. Actually, so this would be actually be, I think I need to provide axis as I think, so that would be like one, say zero and then two. Yeah. Like basically the transpose here, uh, I'm, so you pass in the new order of uh, axes you want. Like in this case, I said, okay, just move the, so basically I want, so prior to that, I basically had this order. So zero, one, and then two. Uh, and then I said, just transpose it in this new order. And then as you can see now, uh, latitude is the first and then time is the second and then, uh, uh, longitude is basically the third. And then if I try to do the same thing, this time, actually I would, uh, NumPy would actually complain because it'd be like, okay, things are not consistent. Uh, and when I say by consistent, again, not, broadcasting is basically based on like two rules. Like the, so the thing that NumPy is trying to do here is it's trying to expand uh, one of the dimensions. And what, by expanding the dimensions, you realize that, oh, I'm actually not getting things that are actually compatible. Uh, so one way of doing this is you could actually do the expand dims uh, by hand. Um, so in this case, I'll have to do... I mean, it's kind of painful, right? That's the point. Yeah, it's painful in the sense that you have to keep track of like, where are my axes? Uh, but then if you, I'm going to skip over, but then in this case, let me actually show you what this would do if I do this uh, at the... Maybe if you go down, um, yeah. So if you did a transpose yeah. there, exactly. So now if I do, let's say transpose, I think this time, I think I have to pass in dimensions. So if I do, let's say lat time, and loan. Uh, actually, wait. Yeah, okay. And now so again, yeah. now if I do this and then I subtract this, things should work mostly because basically, again, from XRA standpoint, it doesn't matter what I need to know is basically what are the names of the dimensions and then XR will know what to do. Whereas with NumPy, you have to keep track of like what axis am I actually uh, referring to? And hopefully that uh, at least clarifies uh, why XRA is, is really doing much better job and making life easier for us by just allowing us to just not really care about the position of our axes, just care about their names. Yeah, so that's exactly right. It's that NumPy kind of works with axes position um, and tries to line those up, but as X-ray, we look at the dimension names and tries to line those up. Yeah. So it gives you a lot more flexibility and a lot less things for you to do when you do such operations. Yeah. Um, there was a question here. Okay. Um, which is if you have two X-rays with similar, I guess, dimension names, lat and long, mm -hmm. um, is it going to go piecewise through each subarray, which I don't understand, or only where the respective lat and long match? Um, so the answer there is these subtractions are basically element twice, um, which is if you're coming from the num by side, that makes sense. Yeah, basically that vectorized. Um, yeah. Um... Uh, another question is how does X-ray deal with NAND values when doing aggregations? Uh, okay, so actually that's, so if you actually look at the um, the doc string, like, let me see where I did compute. I mean, there's, um, there's this argument, skip NA, 
which basically will basically skip missing values. Um, uh, and I think it's not been a year. So I, I think, so is, so Deepak, uh, yeah, correct me here. Is, so is the default value here that you actually skip the values or is it that it doesn't uh, skip the uh, missing values by default unless you tell it to do so? By default, it's calling a NAND mean. So by default, we skip NANDs. Um, yeah. Um, but there's that skip NA flag that is, um, that lets you control that behavior. And then there are some, like it cannot apply, for example, integers that don't have NAND. So there's some details. That's why the default is none. But um, yeah. by default, you're calling the NAND version of the aggregation method. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any other? Yeah, we have a few questions. So another question is, I guess, what happens if you do arithmetic operations when one variable is only defined on a subset? Um, a subset of the coordinate system? like or, uh, Yeah, a subset of the coordinate system. So like, um, OK, hopefully I understand the question. So like, so like in this case, take like something like SST that depends on time, lot, and long, and then uh, do some maybe. operation with some other data array that maybe depends on lot and lot, lot and long, for instance. Is that what it's actually asking? Uh, I think you want to do like a I cell, like an indexing along lat and long, and then do the subtraction. Plus like something like. Sorry, what I what what I thought Kyle's question was mm -hmm. was what if you have two arrays that you want to work on together and they overlap in the dimensions but they don't they're they they do not agree so uh, i think in that case you it won't go right oh uh, so like if there's a uh, the 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 coordinates are not aligned yes well, not aligned or a subset. So, for example, if one array is sort of an island oh. in the middle of another. Oh, I see. So, like for instance, like in this case, if I do like something like, let me say lat equals let's say to, I don't know, twenty. What actually give me? And then long equals let's say one hundred, for instance. I'm actually. See if I can get something that actually pick the land values. point. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So let's say we have that. Well, actually, let me try something. Okay. And let's say we have another one, for instance. I don't know, 50 by long equals two. Do you mean something like this where we take basically, we do something on X and Y? So this will work because the time coordinates are exactly it's the same. The same, yeah. Uh, but maybe what if you did X minus X dot um, I cell time equals slice of three or something. Oh, uh, so X. I mean something like this, for instance. So, uh, so that's going to give you a scalar. Let's do like slice of ten. Oh, yeah. So now we have what Robert calls an island, uh, and you see that the output is only ten. So what X-ray has done has it's found the intersection set. Oh, that's how I think of it. In, I think we call it an inner join, but it's the intersection set of the time uh, coordinate labels between the two. Mm -hmm. And it says that's the only place I can do a subtraction. Sure. And so it gives you just a 10 vector. And those values are exactly the same. So those answers are zero. Yeah. And I, I, also, correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is that you can change that behavior. Like instead yes. of actually doing um, an inner uh, intersection, you can actually, I think, 
that is also uh, controlled through the the options. I think if you do set options, do there's a um, medic join. Yeah. So if you scroll up, it's the second entry. Yeah. Yeah. So the automatic join. Well, it doesn't actually say what other value. I know that the, the, there's a other so like automatic. So if you do, let's do equals outer. Yeah. So that should actually give you the. And so now you see you get one twenty eight. Right? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So yeah, that's how you'd actually control it. Like basically, this is how you would control the alignment. Uh, by default, will give you the intersection, uh, but then you can uh, tell it to do like the union, for instance. Um, another useful one, I guess. So Anderson brought up this concept of alignment, which is the idea of putting things in the same coordinate system. And so inner is basically an intersection set. Outer here is like a union set. Um, and so you get a bunch of nands because there's no corresponding value on the you know on the second object here. Uh, a useful one is exact, which makes sure that the two are on the same coordinate system before it does anything. They would just, uh, yeah, it would give you an error. And sometimes that actually, what's you, that's probably what you want. Like instead of just assuming um, that things are perfectly aligned. Because like if things are not aligned, in some cases, if it, in the case of like the outer join, for instance, XR is happy to do what it needs to do, uh, but it will, in some cases, it may actually give you uh, like weird uh, results. Like for instance, like think of like cases where maybe uh, one of your coordinates is basically, um, is actually not fixed in the sense that it's probably generated by some other process, like where maybe you have some floating point noise in there. And that could actually result into some weird, uh, um, issues where, like, for instance, like you do some operation and then you, you end up having uh, double the size of your uh, coordinate system because basically X-ray realized, oh, it's actually not an exact match. Uh, so it will basically treat each uh, data tick as, as an individual thing. Um, so, yeah. So, like, basically, if you're working with arrays that came from, let's say, from different data sets, for instance, like where maybe you read uh, one variable from some file and then some other variable from another file. Sometimes you may want to make sure that uh, things are actually uh, aligned. Uh, and that's, this is how you basically kind of control that behavior. So you could say, I want you to error if there's a mismatch. Maybe you say, you know what? I don't really care about the mismatch. Just give me like an outer, an outer uh, or in a union, or give me an intersection, which by default, that's what it's actually gonna give you. Okay. Thanks for the question, uh, Robert, and someone else also asked that, but thank you. So, okay, broadcasting, okay. Okay, so this is actually, I think the last, uh, yeah, so we're at 10.35. Um, I don't know how you want to go. Yeah, on. Well, we're almost done. Yeah. yeah. So there's a few like high level uh, computation routines. And if you're familiar with pandas, some of these are actually, uh, some of these are actually familiar, like, like group by, resample, like rolling operations, Colson, um, and then I think this way that is a, uh, this is actually specific to the X-ray because I don't think I've ever seen it in, in, in pandas. Um, but these are the things that usually people want to do, but then if you just have like an umpire array, it's really hard to do. Um, it's doable, uh, but it's not doable by, like for instance, I know that there's a, there's a package called NumPy groupies, which basically will allow you to do like, like a group by on NumPy uh, arrays. But that's not part of NumPy, for instance. Uh, but let's say if you actually want to direct things like resample and stuff like that, that's also not part of uh, NumPy. But X-Array implements these things. Like in this case, I have my data set, but let's say I just actually want to group by, let's say like season of the year. Uh, in this case, I can just do time.season. Uh, and the reason why I can do this is because uh, season here, this is a property that is, um, um, 
available when the time is actually decoded. Uh, so instead of just season, I can do a bunch of other stuff. I can do by day, I can do by month. Uh, basically, there's a bunch of, I can do day of year, for instance. There's a bunch of uh, ways you can do the group by. But for now, let me just do season. Um, and once you do the groups, you can actually now apply operations on those groups. Like in this case, I'm saying group by the season and then compute the mean for each season. So basically what I get is basically a seasonal mean. Um, well, I think this is a bug um, in XRA. So it won't really give you ordered seasons. So you have to order them by uh, order them yourself. Um, so, but then as it gives you can you see- alphabetically. Yeah. Sorry, it gives you alphabetically sorted seasons, which is but not, not useful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like in this case, we basically re-index uh, the, the season by basically saying, okay, it's DGF. Uh, so December, January, February, March, yeah, and so on. And then now for instance, like I can basically like do the plotting. Um, as you can see, I added like a few things this time. So I, so, so XRA has this um, facet grid, which basically allows you to do multiple plots um, by basically specifying, in this case, I'm switching what, uh, let's go back. So I specify this uh, call basically season by saying, I want you to create facet grid by season. Uh, and then I specified uh, the color map here. And then the robust equals to true that that is, um, um, to, basically that is telling XRA, okay, if there's some weird value or some out, uh, outlier, I don't want it to actually affect my plot. So basically it will, uh, um, as far as I can tell, I don't know if it throws it away, but I think that it doesn't include it um, when, it's, uh, when it's doing the plotting. Uh, is that a uh, fair description, Deepak, of what robust equals to true does? Um, sorry, I was typing the answer, but the answer, it does, it takes the second and 98th percentile to choose the color bar axis values. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. copied from Steve Warren and it's a great feature. I use it all the time. Yeah. Okay. So again, you can see basically these are the seasonal means. Um, and then something else is you can actually do resample. Uh, so the resampling, um, at least so far, this only works on the time uh, object. So for instance, you cannot do like a resample on let's say some other uh, uh, dimension. Like in this case, what I'm saying is I'm saying um, basically resample to bi-monthly. Uh, so every two other months. Um, so what I had previously was basically monthly data, and now I'm basically resampling every two, so uh, every two other months, and then I'm computing the mean of that. Uh, so what I end up getting is basically okay. Now I have January, and then so basically January, and then March, uh, and then May. So if I wanted to, so this is basically down sampling. So, but if I wanted to, I could actually change this to let's say maybe, uh, maybe. Every five days, like say, let's go five days, for instance. Uh, um, so one thing to keep in mind is that this is like, in, if you care about uh, weighing uh, uh, basically your new uh, um, axis, like in this case, if let's say like in right now, XRA is not a way of any kinds of like weights. So you basically treat every data point uh, equally. Um, so doing it in ways that, uh, like for instance, if you have like weird calendars where maybe, uh, for instance, um, not all months have exactly the same number of days and uh, you're down sampling or, or up sampling to those frequencies, you may want to weigh each uh, interval appropriately. Um, and that's something you have to do on your own, um, at least so far, uh, XRA doesn't allow you to do those kinds of uh, weighted operation. There's some other ways of doing weighted operation, but that doesn't apply to resample. And then another operation that is probably of interest is basically you can do like computer like things like rolling uh, aggregations. Like in this case, I'm computing uh, like a rolling mean uh, with a window side of seven. Um, by, def by default, uh, the window, 
uh, is not centered. Yeah, it's false. But then you can basically configure some of this stuff. You could specify if you want the window to be centered, for instance, uh, or if you want to specify like how what's the, the threshold of like minimum periods you need to have in each window. Um, so you could also do that. Um, so yeah, so, and then there's a basically like a bunch of other stuff that I didn't cover. Like for instance, I didn't cover uh, like Colson or weighted, uh, but those are other things that uh, are basically built in that um, I think you should take advantage of. Um, so yeah, and with that, I think uh, at least uh, as, as uh, tutorial content uh, are concerned, I think that's it for today. Uh, so I can uh, address uh, some of the questions that may have come. Uh, come up. Okay, so do we have any questions? Um, okay. There's not really much so far. Ah, with rolling, can you use a handing window? Um, so the, the answer there is uh, there's a construct method for rolling. Um, and so I'll just type in the answer. Okay. And then in the meantime, um, let's see, what other question do we have? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Deepak. Okay. Sophie okay, asked, so this is a good question. It's the difference. What is the dif basically? What is the difference between resample and group by? At least, okay, okay. Um, I've 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 run into this issue before, um, and my at least my answer, which uh, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is that it depends on basically what your period or what your time periods looks like. Like if they actually uh, if they fit. Uh, like for instance, if you're moving, let's say from, let's say monthly data to let's say annual data, for instance, my understanding is that usually that should give you exactly something, if it, that should give you the same thing or something close. But then if you're moving into those cases where your, basically your uh, incoming period uh, doesn't fit perfectly in the outgoing period, like let's say like, for instance, let's say you move from uh, like what, like for instance, um, let's say you move from monthly and then you wanna move uh, to, let's say to a five day frequency, for instance, you cannot do that with, uh, yeah, with group by, you cannot really say group by five days, for instance, that's, uh, XRA doesn't understand that. Um, is that a fair description or maybe it wasn't even, uh, that uh, uh, straightforward, but that's the way to think about it. Like you can do like time dot month, uh, but you cannot like when you're doing group by, for instance, you cannot really group by. Let's say like a factor, uh, like you cannot do like group by every other two days. You can group by day, you can group by months, uh, but you cannot really group by let's say two days, for instance. Does that? Or do you want to yes. add something? So there's a there's a kind of higher level difference, which is if you say group by time dot month, you will end up getting back a twelve element vector, right? Mm -hmm. Just one per month, um, and you have like reduced across all of the years. But if you said resample um, to month, what you'll end up getting is one point per month per year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So. A group by is just going to ignore. Is all it's going to do is look at the month and nothing else. It won't. It won't keep different years separate. Um, but as resample, will do that. Yeah. Okay. So, as a question, can you point to the documentation for definition of time periods? Say yeah. thirty point five day monthly. Um, I would refer you to pandas. So under the hood, we're using pandas. So we support um, basically so, everything that pandas does. So actually, if you go to pandas, 
Let me see if I can actually. So if you go to the Pandas documentation page, um, it's not easy to find, uh, but um, I think, what is it called actually? Is it time it's offset, is that? Yeah, dates, oh. offsets. Yeah, it's hidden somewhere that sometimes it's not uh, an easy thing to find. Uh, let me see. Uh, wait. I always have trouble finding the space, but it's a very useful table. Yeah, I. What is it? Yeah, I think this is the same page. Um, let me actually. I think I usually have to go through. Is it actually, is it time offset or is it date offset? I usually have had time really finding, but I know that it's a page somewhere. Uh, but my understanding is that we did at some point, at least as far as I can remember, I did work on at least adding this somewhere in the XRA documentation. Let me see. So I found it and I'm putting it in the chat. Okay, good. So you can put any of those strings in resample. Yeah. So yeah, that's the, that's the page. Uh, I think if you scroll down, yeah, that's that table. <laughs> yeah. And so the one thing to actually keep in mind is what Pandas describes here is only for the standard or the Gregorian calendar. So if you have, because in XRA, you can actually have other calendars other than uh, Gregorian. Um, so if you have things like that, some of these things may not be relevant for that. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind. Uh, so yeah, like for instance, like to know that uh, this is let's say like the first day of the quarter, for instance, Minus things that you also need to know what calendar you're on. Um, so, some of, yeah, again, like some of this stuff uh, may not apply to some weird calendars. Like if you have like like a Nolly, for instance, calendar, or if you have know, like a three six day calendar, uh, which XRA is okay uh, with, uh, but Pandas doesn't have any uh, knowledge of um, uh, those other non-standard calendars. Do we have any other question or? Uh, I think that okay. was it. So, so okay, before, so again, this was mostly just like an overview of, of XRA, um, uh, but in the future, we'll also have uh, a session on XRA and Dask, which basically once you get past the fundamentals, this is actually the, I'd say the fun part. Um, so, uh, we will we will announce uh, when we may have this uh, tutorial about XRA and Dask um, in the coming days, uh, uh, and also something else to um, keep in mind is that we're going to have probably like a repeat of uh, this session. So if you know folks that uh, maybe wanted to attend this session but couldn't, um, uh, we will also share information about when we may uh, have a repeat of this session. Um, and then uh, last thing is that uh, we have a recording of this session. So we will post it on, on YouTube and we'll uh, let you know uh, if at some point you basically wanna go back and uh, uh, review some of the stuff that we covered um, at uh, your own pace. Um, so with that, uh, I think that's it for today, uh, unless uh, Deepak and Martin wants to add anything. Just thank you everyone for coming. This was good fun. Uh, hope it oh, was useful. So, uh, so Danica is asking, where will you post information on coming, upcoming tutorials? So right now, um, okay, so at least the channels we've been using is basically XRAs and, and Dask's uh, Twitter. Uh, uh, so I don't know. 
does actually Deepak does X ray have like a mail list or like does it have any? We have a mailing list, but I think this sold out so quickly there wasn't even time to get to yeah. any other. So <laughs> another place to look at is actually the Pangeo uh, discourse. Um, so let me actually see if I can. So if you go to uh, discourse.panjo.io. Um, so yeah, so if you go to the, there's an education thread. At least that's where I, I posted uh, this one. So I, I basically did let people know that um, if they're interested, they should just watch this thread and I'll basically be uh, posting uh, future uh, uh, information about future sessions here. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I, I, those are the only two ways I can think of at least as of today. Yeah, well, it doesn't seem like most people uh, nowadays use mail lists. So it's, uh, but we can post there as well if that's useful. Uh, but I don't even know what the address of that mail list is. Yeah, we, we can we can do a better job of spreading this. Yeah. Um, this is a very quick, and Anderson was very efficient at organizing this. <laughs> well, I'm glad, and thank you for your for your help. Uh, and uh, Martin, do you want to say anything? Or uh, uh, no? Well, it, it was uh, it was nice for me to see too. <laughs> okay, good, good. All right, people. Um, once again. Thank you uh, for your time. Um, and uh, if you have more questions, I would say um, um, check out uh, Panjo's discourse. Like if you actually have like usage questions, I feel like, okay, how do I do this in X-ray and stuff like that? Uh, I would say probably Panjo discourse is, is a good uh, way to stay connected. Um, and if you run into some bugs or some future request, please go ahead and at least don't be uh, shy. Uh, so go ahead and post them on uh, X-arrays, GitHub repo. Um, and with that, I'll basically uh, let you go. Um, and uh, looking forward to seeing you um, in future sessions. Okay.